Zoute zee slaakt een diepe zilte zucht. Boven het vlakke land trilt stil de warme lucht. Welcome back to the show and indeed the Netherlands. The Netherlands, seen around the world as one of the most liberal countries when it came to the legalization of soft drugs, prostitution or abortion, it has led the way. And back in 2001, it was the first country ever to allow it for assisted suicide or euthanasia for anyone over the age of 16 who was in intolerable suffering with no hope of improvement. Today, it's thinking about extending this right to anyone who isn't sick but simply wants to die. They will be allowed to be helped by by professionals, Luke Brown reports. For a 96-year-old widower, Peter Yiskoop is in fine fettle. He exercises 15 minutes a day, but he wants to have the option of taking his own life, even if his health does not deteriorate. Because I don't have the pill, I have already experienced several low points. Especially after my wife and daughter died, I was ready to jump off the balcony. But then you think about what kind of problems that would cause for other people. Legal euthanasia has been available for those in unbearable suffering since 2002. The Dutch government wants to extend that law to include those who consider they've lived a full life. Peter, a keen sailor in his prime, wants to feel he has control of his future right to the end. Can I decide for myself to shorten or end my suffering? That should be up to me and not the government or politicians. And that is my fight that I have been fighting. We decide the end of our lives when we get to a stage that we're no longer able to carry on. The current euthanasia criteria are strict, limited to the terminally ill with no hope of recovery, as well as patients suffering from dementia or mental illness. Usually after multiple consultations, it's the family doctor that delivers the fatal injection. But some cases are received by the end-of-life clinic. It helped nearly 500 people die last year. In the middle of photos, you that. In the middle picture, you see Mr. Petersma, who has just died, after our doctor and nurse have just given him the substances, which let him pass away. It's not a sad occasion. It is such a relief for the patient that the loved ones also see that it is an improvement. The Netherlands has Europe's most liberal euthanasia laws, but some still reject it on ethical grounds. In Parliament, the Christian Union Party says more should be done to help those reaching the end of their lives, not simply assisting the final step. There are very many people, elderly people, in vulnerable positions who feel pressure from society you don't have to be here anymore, you can take a pill. And that's the big danger if the government starts providing this pill. In 2015, over 5,500 cases of euthanasia were recorded, up 75% in five years. The new law will likely increase that number, but for its defenders at the Right to Die Association, it's necessary to prevent people from taking desperate measures. Of course there are solutions. You can take these pills, uh, you can stop with eating and drinking, but that's not what they want. And with this new law, they will have the option of a professional being there, helping them guide through the end uh, of their days uh, and die in dignity. The government wants to pass the law by the end of the year, but it could be buried by the outcome of the general elections in March. Meaning Peter may still have some time to wait until he can finally choose the moment of his own death. Well, whether or not that law comes to pass won't have an effect on the people playing here for quite some time. But we've come to this sports ground to meet with an MEP for the PVDA, the Dutch Labour Party, uh, Mr. Paul Tang. Good morning, Mr. Tang. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Thanks nice for your you. time. Uh, tell me, uh, we were just looking very briefly at a report about the new euthanasia laws being proposed in the Netherlands. That's something your party and the main party in government, the VVD, uh, agree on. However, differ very, very sharply on other issues, notably migration, which is one of the hot topics of these general elections. Yeah, there's been uh, some, uh, some fights within government. Uh, migration, but also on uh, flexible labour and, uh, and so on, yes. Where does the Netherlands stand today on this issue of migration? Because the party of Geert Wilders seems to be, uh, you know, using it as, as one of the main reasons behind his party, saying be afraid of, of migrants coming in. The Dutch in general, are they afraid? Uh, I think what you see in Holland, you see in, uh, in every country, um, and especially after the election of Trump, 
uh, people there to speak out even more. Um, and what you see in, in, in Holland is that we become more split in a sense. So Amsterdam is a very optimistic city. Ever since the mid 80s, it has been booming and growing and was not much affected by the crisis. So in Amsterdam, Geert Wilders and his party doesn't have much impact in previous election, and I don't expect it this time either. Okay, well, let's have a little quick chat then with the young people playing here. You're 17 yeah. and you're 18, right? Yeah. So you can vote. Do you know what you're going to vote? No, not yet. Not yet. Do you know what you kind of what you would vote if you were? No, not really. Oh, the world is changing, right? Who knows? Yeah, we will see what happens and uh, we hope for the best. <laughs> so, so, and what is the best then? So what, um, do, you, what, no what do you think is... And, no uh, war and peace and no racism uh, in the world. You know. is, is racism an issue, issue here? Uh, no, is it, not is here, but maybe in the United States there's a lot of here. And not, and not here in Amsterdam or because... Do you think Holland is changing also? We see Geert Wilders coming yeah, up, uh, we see Trump outside, perhaps, but Geert Wilders inside Holland, does it change our country? It does. If Wilders... Yes. If it gets to be a president of uh, Premier, yeah. I think it will change the Netherlands, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's a little bit anxious because he's uh, kind of racist and is dis uh, discriminating a lot of people in the Netherlands. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's anxious for the people who are um, not born here or have two parents who are from, uh, aren't from this country. Um, or they will stay here or be deported from the Netherlands, it's uh, scary. What about Europe? Is what, what this Europe means to you? I think it's important to stay in the uh, European yeah. Union. Okay, well, for me the European Union is, let's say, economic opportunities, mm -hmm. traveling, but it also means an open society. Yeah. Well, you say that Amsterdam is an optimistic city, but it's also a pretty polluted one from what we're hearing. There was even an NGO that took the Dutch government yeah. to court saying you're not doing enough uh, to protect no. the clean air. No, Holland is backward in uh, in a transformation towards sustainable energy, no doubt about that. And then Amsterdam is not, it's a very beautiful city. Uh, and relatively clean because people travel on bikes, right? Not on, not on cars, on scooters. Uh, but we still have a lot to do in uh, the transformation to sustainable energy. Um, wind energy on sea is for becoming very important. But it also means co closing coal plants uh, just behind me. I, you can't see it because of the fog, but there's a, there's a coal plant and it's, it should be shut. Uh, so we have still five coal plants and it's the one uh, on the list to be, sh uh, to be shut down. But it was also uh, a huge fight in the coalition car government and it was postponed until after the election. So a new government has to do that. But at the end of the day, it will have to close. <laughs> Well, transport is responsible for one quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions in the EU. Since January of this year, all of the Dutch electric trains are run on wind power. And while the number of wind farms in the country has increased in order to help power that, not all of the energy is generated here, as Johan Bonan reports. This is the Amsterdam to Haarlem train line, the oldest in the Netherlands. Just like every other train in the country, it's now solely powered by electricity generated by the wind. Kelly Roll has been a ticket inspector for two years. Now her train is one of the greenest in the world. The energy no longer comes from coal plants, but from wind turbines. The passengers don't see any difference. But for people who live in the area, they notice, because the air quality is better. So it concerns more than just the passengers. The 600,000 daily passengers on Dutch trains now have a carbon footprint close to zero. One wind turbine in one hour generates enough power for a train to run 200 kilometers. Well, I, I'm taking the train just because I care about the environment. So it makes uh, my choice even more rational. And it's very good for, for climate change. So uh, we hope that also other things uh, in Holland, uh, more and more people are going to use uh, solar or wind energy. The rail company reached its target of 100% wind power a year early, an achievement announced by the CEO in an unexpected manner. To meet the train network's demand, the Dutch built two brand new wind farms. This one in Westermeer has 48 turbines. The Netherlands still has to import power from Belgium and Scandinavia to cover its rail needs, but it is a considerable step forwards.
We use uh, the same amount of electricity that all the households of Amsterdam use. So uh, we are in the top three of uh, big electricity consumers in the Netherlands. And that's, that's why it's so important that we uh, use renewable electricity. Wind farms are now part of the Dutch landscape. There are over 2,000 turbines dotted around the country and the coastline. Not everyone welcomes this development. In the small port of Urk, a years-long campaign was waged to stop the construction of a major offshore wind farm. As well as fearing harm to the region's wildlife, the local opposition complained the 200-metre pylons would make too much noise and were far too big. If you go see that way there are windmills and that way there are uh, many more windmills, we must all make sacrifices. But uh, these windmills are, are much too big for this area. There will be more. The whole nature of the Isomere will, yeah, will be destroyed. It will be one big uh, industrial area. Wind power may be on the rise in the Netherlands, but on the whole the country lags badly when it comes to renewable energy sources. They provided less than 6% in 2015, making its EU target of 16% by 2023 distinctly ambitious. Well, we're going to turn to something very different now, literally something out of this world. We're here at the European Space Agency. There are European Space Agency centres across Europe, but here in the Netherlands, in Noordwijk, it is the largest one. We're with uh, Ms. Cora van Nieuwenhuizen. You're one of the spokespeople for the European Parliament on space. Mm -hmm. Space really one example where more than anywhere else, countries manage to cooperate and work together. Yes, and it's very important that we do, uh, because we want to be independent as Europe and not rely totally on uh, the US uh, or Russia, for example, for our navigation in our cars uh, or for our telecommunication. We need satellites uh, for that. So I think we really uh, need to cooperate and invest in space. Well, let's meet with Mr. Leopold Samar. I'd love to meet you. Uh, your head of Welcome Advanced uh, Strategic Studies. Um, so I imagine you agree with Mr. Van Nieuwenhuizen that space a very important uh, sector for Europe. Absolutely, it's a growth sector. I believe the budget from the European Commission was something like 12 billion from 2014 to 2020 on that space sector. Is that enough though? When you look at it, it looks like the, over in the US there's uh, companies really that are entering this space race, notably with this idea of reusable rockets. Is the EU really doing enough? Is there that willingness to do as much? Well, in Europe we have we have a, a relatively complicated situation that has advantages and disadvantages. So there's investment by the European Union, there's investment by member states, there's investment by member states via ESA, and all this together is still relatively low compared to our competitors. And let's not forget about the private sector. Yes. I think it's also necessary that the private sector Absolutely. invests uh, as well. And it's a difficult area to develop as well. There was even some problems with these Galileo satellites, which yes. you know allow us to use EU GPS systems rather than American ones. Of course, what we do in space is not easy. I mean, otherwise, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> what we do in space is difficult because many many things have never been done before. So we invest into the basic enabling technology that has the and uh, direct advantages by the satellites that we put up there, by better Earth observation images that are interesting for precision farming, that are interesting for construction sites. And, but, but what we really also should not forget is the technology that we develop for space and to make these services from space more efficient, better. Uh, they are also have an, an indirect impact afterwards because we spin them out to completely different sectors then are useful for medical applications for completely different so research uh, and development in general that we can all benefit from in other absolutely. sectors uh, very finally of course there's currently a french astronaut up yes. on the international space station how has his mission been going ah, he's doing fantastic yeah? he's really doing very well very professional He's also very dedicated to his mission. Uh, all the experiments, as far as I'm aware, are going extremely well. Mm -hmm. So you probably have seen the, his spacewalk, which was absolutely fantastic. The first time with high resolution, high definition uh, videos. So it was, we were all uh, behind our screens. Uh, it was, uh, Indeed, that definitely is attractive to watch. Well, Mr. Samara, thanks so much for your time. Also to you, Mr. Van Nieuwenhausen, thank you. Uh, we're going to leave you now with a few images of that spacewalk of Thomas Pasquet.
Pesquet in the suit with no stripes, and Expedition Commander Shane Kimbra in the suit with red stripes are currently replacing two electric batteries used to power the station. The mission is designed to modernize the ISS and will take more than six hours to complete, a task requiring a lot of precision. It takes 90 minutes for the ISS to orbit the Earth, during which the astronaut will spend 45 minutes working in sunlight and the other 45 minutes in total darkness. Thomas Pesquet is the 10th French astronaut in space and the fourth to complete a spacewalk. I'm very happy it's like a dream within a dream because it's a great experience. Somehow we become a spaceship even though we're attached to the station because we don't want to go too far. I've been training years for this moment, so I'm happy. See you next time on Europe Now.